In this tutorial, we're going to take a look at cellular automata mathematical systems. Cellular automata systems are discrete computational systems that rely on a series of rules defined by a neighborhood of cells. The game constantly updates based on the rules dictating each cell, and cells can have a variety of states that change over time. Cellular automata can simulate a variety of real-world systems, including biological and chemical ones. In this tutorial, we're going to look specifically at Conway's Game of Life, developed by British mathematician John Horton Conway. It's a zero-player game, meaning the evolution of the patterns are determined by the initial input. Cells in the system can either be alive, shown in white, or dead, shown in black. Conway's Game of Life is built on a series of rules that dictate the current state, alive or dead, of each cell in the system. Let's talk through these rules. Any live cell with two or three neighbours survives. Any dead cell with three live neighbours becomes a live cell. All other live cells die in the next generation. Similarly, all other dead cells stay dead. We can translate these rules directly into Grasshopper and simulate this system using the Anemone plugin. If you don't have the Anemone plugin installed, download it from foodforrhino.com before you start this tutorial. On my screen, I have a Grasshopper template file containing the rules for Conway's Game of Life. You can download this template from thedifferentdesign.com. The first thing we want to do is generate a grid of cells to form our neighborhood. Let's begin by creating a rectangle component that will form the basis for our cellular grid. I'm just going to go on a top view because we're working in 2D in this tutorial. I'm going to create a rectangle with a domain, so I'm going to create a domain here. And the domain's going to be between 0 and 1. I might go 0, 1.0. We'll just make the maximum 2, but we'll have it as a value of 1 here, like that. And then I'm going to create a rectangular array, this one here. And we're going to array a point based on this rectangular cell we've created. So I'm going to make this as the cell. And then I'm going to create a point. I'm going to right click and set one point at the origin. And we're going to array this geometry to create a nice cellular effect or grid effect. And let's just make it a grid size of 30 by 30 to get started with like that. So this will be the grid in which we run our cellular automata or game of life system on. The next thing we want to do is generate the topology for the neighbors of each cell in this grid system. So we want to find out which cell has which neighbors in the whole process. Conway's Game of Life works on a more neighborhood system, which is a two-dimensional square lattice composed of a central cell and eight cells that surround it. So at any one time, one cell could only ever have a maximum of eight cells, but it could have as few as, say, three if you were in the corner cell. And we need to generate this topology as a data tree in Grasshopper. We can do this with a proximity 2D component. So just drop a proximity 2D onto your canvas, and we're going to drop the points from our rectangular array into the points input for proximity 2D. So straight away we get a base topology, but we do need to do a bit of tweaking to get towards that more neighborhood setup. So the maximum that we can have in a group is eight. So I'm just gonna create a panel and we're gonna have eight cells. And I'll plug that into the group. And then we're gonna tether our maximum radius to this number slider at the start, just in case we ever wanted to update the size of the grid. So I'm gonna input the maximum radius of one here, but the radius of one would not encapsulate these kind of corner cells from a central point. So we just need to do a little bit of an algorithmic tweak to this. I'm gonna say X times 1.5, like that. And that should encapsulate those eight cells that we have nicely whenever we change this value. So now we've got a topology coming out of here, and if you hover over it, you'll see you get a data tree coming out. And we can test this topology. Basically what's being spit out here is a bunch of links, which are lines that visualize the connection points for each neighboring cell, and then a topology, which is a series of integer values that tell us which cell is connected to which other point. So we've got point zero here, and we create a little panel, we could look at the topology and understand that it's connected to point 30, point 1, and point 31 coming out of this rectangular array. Now let's just quickly test these links to make sure they're working. So I'm going to create a branch component, so tree branch, and I'm going to simplify the data tree coming out of links. And then maybe we just look at branch number 50. 
So if we zoom to that, you'll see that branch number 50 has a connection to eight different cells in the neighborhood, which seems correct. So our topology is looking like it's going to be working for our game of life simulation. So now we want to generate some starting states for our cells in this system. Our cells can only be of two types of states. They can be alive or dead. So we're going to represent this as integers. We're going to represent a dead cell as a zero and an alive cell as a one. And we're going to start with just a random array throughout our grid. So I'm going to create a random component here. And the range is between 0 and 1, which is what I want. But I'm going to right click on the random and change it to integers. So we just get a bunch of integer outputs. We want to have the same number of random values as we do array geometries, because these random values are going to dictate whether or not these cells or these points are alive or dead. So let's create a list length component and plug the geometry into there. And we're going to plug that list length into number. And then what we'll get is a bunch of zeros and ones coming out of random. And we could quickly visualize this with, say, a cull pattern component. So we could just cull that pattern. And you see that those would be the alive cells because they're set to 1, which, of course, translate to a true value inside of Grasshopper. So if we look back to our rules, we want to start figuring out whether or not a live cell has two or three neighbors or a dead cell has three neighbors. So basically what we need is we need a value that represents whether or not our neighbors are alive or dead, just a total value. And we can start doing this by using the topology coming out of our proximity 2D component. So let's go and use a list item component. And this topology, these integer values that are coming out of here, are going to serve as our indices. And we're going to drop that into there. And then those indices can relate back to these random values we've created. Because we know that in you know our first branch, we've got neighbors 31 and 31. So if we grabbed item 31 and 31 from these random values, we'll get a better understanding of whether or not the the cells that surround the current point are alive or dead. So let's plug that into list and we can have a look at the output from that. So this is telling us that cell 30 is alive, cell 1 is dead and cell 31 is alive, which means we have a total of two neighbors that are alive. So if cell 0 is alive, that means that it would survive the next round because it has two neighbors that are alive, so it would survive. And we can basically go and add all these up with a simple mass addition component now in Grasshopper. And we can get a better understanding of which cells are going to survive the next round depending on their state. So we could flatten that. And then we get a full list uh, of our neighbors or our total neighbors for each cell that are alive in the system. So now that we've got those neighbor values, we want to run a test. We want to run a test on all of the alive cells and see if they have two or three neighbors. And then we want to run a test on any of the dead cells and see if they have exactly three live neighbors. And then that'll give us the basis for our next generation of the game of life. So to run that test, we do need to split these things up in two. And to do that, let's use something called a sift pattern component, which is this one here. So we're going to basically split this into two outputs. Uh, based on these random values we had here. So we're going to put these randoms in to our sift pattern, and that's going to be the way that we sift these mass addition components. So I'm going to plug that into list. And what it'll do is it'll output all the dead cells uh, with their neighbor values, and it'll just null all the alive cells for right now. So we don't need to worry about the alive cells in this pattern. The alive cells will come through in this one, where all of the dead cells are nulled there. And it just gives the opportunity to really cleanly and easily operate on these two different things. So let's try and do the dead cell test first. So what we need to test with our dead cell is whether or not we have exactly three live neighbors uh, surrounding the dead cell that we're currently looking at. So we can easily just test this out with an equals component or equality component here. And we're going to say, is this cell equal to 3? Or is the value of the neighbors in this cell equal to a 3? We'll plug that into there. And then that, of course, could be translated to an integer component, because what it does is it spits out a bunch of true or false values. But what we want to do is see the integers. So basically, if our dead cell is equal to this test, it will turn into a 1. And therefore, we can use that 1 to 
generate the next level of cells. It will turn that dead cell into an alive cell. It will turn from zero into one. So let's group this and we'll just call it dead cell test like that. And that's a pretty easy test. The second test we need to do is for our alive cells. So it's a little bit trickier because we need to do two tests. We need to see if any alive cell has two or three live neighbors. So we could go and do two equality tests and add them together to create, you know, an integer value that would in theory work. But there's a little bit of an easier way we can go about doing this. If we go to the math tab and we go to the domain drop down menu, we can select the includes uh, domain test. From this, what this will do is it will test if our numbers lie within a specific domain. So let's set that domain up. Our domain is going to be between two and three. So we're basically testing whether or not these values coming out of output one are between two or three. And because we've only got integer values, it's basically saying, are they two or three? So we can plug that into here. And once again, we'll get a bunch of true or false values coming out of here so we can translate that into integers as well and that'll be enough to do our alive test so if we group that we're going to find out whether or not our cells that are already alive have two or three neighbors so if they do we'll get an integer of one and if they don't that alive cell will become an integer of zero which means it will now be dead so let's call this alive cell test So this third rule is actually encapsulated in both of these tests. If our live cells have one neighbor or more than three neighbors, they're going to die. We're already doing that test. We're going to get a zero value. And then all of the dead cells, they're going to remain dead unless they have three live neighbors in the simulation. So now we just want to combine these two integer containers together. And we're going to do that with a combined data component. So I'm just going to grab a combined data component. So from input zero and input one, the combined data component is basically gonna take these lists of inputs and combine all of the non-null items in the uh, groups that we've put through or in the list that we've put through. So we should get a list of one and zero values. And this list will represent the next generation of cells in our cellular automata. So basically if we did another Carl Patton component, we could clearly visualize what's going on here. And we could easily then go and compare it to our original list as well. So this was our starting point in our generation. And after one iteration of the game of life, we get to this simulation. So the CA doesn't work on just one generation, obviously. It's a game that continues going on and the process keeps working over time. So now we need to introduce Anemone into this system to create a bit of a loop that's going to enable us to test this system over multiple iterations. So I'm going to come up to the Anemone plugin over here, and we're just going to use the basic start and end loops from Anemone. So we'll plug this guy over to here to create that link between the loops. Uh, to start, I always like to just have maybe two iterations, just because Anemone can get messed up with data structures pretty easily. And what you don't want is to get into a loop that goes for 100 iterations and causes your computer to crash. So it's always good to just start with two as a test first. We'll have a little button to trigger the test. And the data that we want to input into this loop start are the integer values that basically form the starting point of our CA algorithm. So let's go ahead and plug that guy into here and then plug that into data. And then this data output has to override whatever is coming from these random values here. So let's plug into there and plug into there. So that data is gonna come in and then it's gonna start looping through as our CA output. Then we just want to grab the results coming out of our combined data component. So we could create another integer component just to make sure they're coming out nicely as integers and plug that into our data. And straight away, that's going to go ahead and loop through. And to be honest, it seems like it's working okay. I don't see any kind of errors there. I mean, we could do a bit of a uh, cull index, oh, sorry, cull pattern component again and just check how that runs as we kind of run through it. So we'll grab these points from back here and we could hit that button. That looks okay as a starting point. 
um, but obviously it's a bit hard for us to visualize it straight away. So let's maybe just work on the visualization of these cells a little bit. What I'm actually going to do is do a dispatch component as well, because that'll enable us to visualize both the alive and dead cells. So let's plug those guys into dispatch here, like that. Um, and now we've got the alive cells coming out of A and the dead cells coming out of B as far as I understand it. So we could probably go and preview everything else off here except for this dispatch which we'll preview off in a second anyway. And what we might do here is we might just create a plane component, a plane surface component. And let's make it a domain, we'll do a construct domain, I'll just get it from math up here. and We'll make the X and Y size just 0 and 1. So we're creating a little cell here. And then we might just orient the data or the geometry from here to this list A. So there's our alive cells. And then we'll do the same thing to our list B. And those will be our dead cells. And then we can just create a nice little preview component. Uh, the alive cells, let's make them white. And we'll make the dead cells black, like that. And let's preview the rest of this off. So now if you started pressing a loop on the simulation, you start to get a feel for that. And I think I'm feeling kind of comfortable with how this simulation is running. So maybe we'll just up that to 10 iterations. And then you start to see the patterns of the game of life emerge. So we could go for 50 now and see how that kind of game unfolds. And it should kind of continue to unfold for quite a while. There probably is a point where perhaps it gets a little bit static, but it looks pretty good so far where it is actually kind of continuing on a nice loop. So that's basically how you'd set up a pretty simple game of life system using Anemone inside of Grasshopper. And you could go ahead and, you know, experiment with some of these parameters, start trying to change the random starting points. Eventually, as you kind of see, it does peter out into a repetitive pattern. So you might try different types of starting points to uh, resolve that issue.